Well, you might find this difficult to believe that this Les Paul was once white. Yes, I thought it was TV yellow when I saw it. Now, you'll notice straight away, I've changed the nut already. So, that's on. It's not fixed in place. So, I'm ahead of the game. But that's because I do that a bit off camera, because it takes quite a lot of careful finessing and fitting. So, that's done. Um, but we're here to do a number of things, um, set up stuff. So, we've got, we're going to replace these tuners with black uh, 19 to 1 tuners. I'm going to precision level the frets. We're going to scrape away some excessive, well, the fingerboard has dried over time. So we've got some, I don't know if you can see it there, not very well, but we've got some sort of crunchy resin sticking up. So we'll need to just sand that, uh, scrape that back. Um, we're going to put on black hardware here and black thing around that side. Um, and I forgot there's one more black thing, but we didn't order one of those. But it's kind of not really gold anyway, it's a bit chrome-like. Anyway, so this has a what looks like a it looks like an Aussie Osborne and a I don't know Giza Butler. Am I is that my guess? I'm I'm just getting guessing. Do those two names come up together? Would they be in the same thing? I don't know. I suppose I could look online and, and, and un unmake a fool of myself. But you guys out there will know. It's like asking me the names of the people who are in the cause. Oh yes, the cause. It's Andrea Core. It's the other core bloke. Anyway, no, I don't. I don't know. But I'm guessing Ozzy Osbourne and Giza Butler. So obviously, I'm not going to be trying to um, clean this back to white at any time soon. It's got active uh, EMGs and a bit of a rattle with a loose pickup. So that's one of the things I'm going to want to sort out first. Is do that. So let's leave that till afterwards. I think the thing to do now will be to set a low action because it's playing quite high at the moment. We'll just poke my glasses in the eye. We'll set a low action and um, we'll then go ahead and level the frets. So I'm just going to see what you can see. It's piddling down with rain out here on a Saturday evening in good old fashioned England. Um, uh, what am I doing? I'm going downwards. Um, I suppose I could slack all the things off again and do this. But I'm just trying to wind it down using this tool. Um, yeah, piddling down with rain. We, we had our fabulous, I don't know, five or six weeks of gorgeous sunshine. It was called June. And after that, it just pretty much has disappeared. Shouldn't I shouldn't complain? It's um. Which way am I going? I can never figure this out. Uh, on these wiry things, if I'm going the opposite way, why am I? Why is it so hard to hard to figure it out? Down, down is down. Backwards is down. Why am I going the opposite way? No, that's up. <laughs> ah, no, I've just made it impossible. I think the answer would be slack off the strings. It's much easier to get your handle on it. Finding out what's going on is never easy if you, um, you have the strings under tension. So, although it's a bit of a faff, I will do that. Yeah, anyway, so rain, 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 rain. British summer, blah, blah, blah. It's become quite traditional feeling now. Okay, doing it up to take it down doing it up to take it down. I'm having to now do a bit of trial and error, of course, because there's no way of knowing. But what I probably can do is just get away with doing the uh, low E and the high E. This guitar has slightly strangely out of, out of alignment strings down the neck. And unfortunately, there is nothing we can do to realign them short of installing a um, Installing a, a shallow 3D bridge with um, variable spacing, but that is something that I could recommend. That okay, which way am I going now? That's oh, going down, isn't it? What an idiot. Um, I could recommend to Andy that he could consider doing that at a later date. Um, pretty easy to do, I should think. Why is it so hard to f figure out which way around this goes? 
backwards to go up. So we're going to lower the action a little bit here. Oh, that's now too high. Lower the action, and then we're going to do the leveling. So that's, that's about right on that side. And I would say we're about right on this side. Let's tighten it up, if not, not the technical word. Uh, put under tension. heat storms going on in Europe while we are sitting in our drizzly rainy place here. Roller bridge, 90 to 1 tuners, black stop bar, black locking uh, uh, jack socket. So we've got all the goodies. But yes, um, 50 degrees or somewhere in Greece. I mean, just insane temperatures and all the People in the know now just saying, uh, that's it, we've absolutely missed the, oh, we've got X amount of time to save the, save the um, universe, no, save the uh, climate to undo the temperature increase. Now, I know there will be people who leap on here and go, ah, you sheeple, you have been sheepled into believing, blah, blah, blah. And in fact, it's all a global conspiracy to make us give up our phone stroke technology stroke whatever um, and that's okay if you believe that right and I've had this discussion one and a half million times but if you do believe that uh, do do us both a favor if you're going to arrive and say are oh, you absolute no actually, actually I'd, I'd be really grateful if you'd arrive and not begin with that the insults so as if as if you really wanted to show how much better you feel about yourself but I would I would prefer that you came with the view that you disagree and I would really invite you to tell me um, tell me how you well, how you disagree explain how you disagree by the way I'm just about to do a small adjustment on the truss right here I want to straighten it a little bit um, yeah so come and tell me how it is you uh, disagree um, and in doing so, you know, put a put an argument as to how you disagree. And you know, in order to do that, I, your argument has to be coherent. You can't just be insulting me and, and saying, I, you know, I'm clearly a sheeple and being led by the the conspiracy people, or you know, whatever is usually the thing. You know, don't don't start with argu uh, with insults. Start with a case that's that can be questioned and to some degree challenged. I think that would be what I would I, I would always expect of you. That's my personal request if you're going to um, turn up and decide you disagree. Um, which is absolutely happy for you to disagree, but do be, do be decent enough and put a case as to why. And if you don't, and if you just insult or refer to sort of abstract random things with, that, with no backup, then what I'll take from it is you don't strictly really believe what you're saying because you don't dare or you can't risk explaining it in such a way that somebody might critique it or challenge it back and I think that's you know people who insult whether they like to face it or not when you insult somebody instead of debate with them you are demonstrating no matter what you say you're demonstrating that you do not have the courage to argue um, your position simple as that okay here's my guitar playing. Notice we've got the old stuff on there, it doesn't really matter at the moment. I'm now going to calibrate the levelling beam and we're going to get going. So nothing really complicated about this. Now some people, again, think, keep in mind the thing I just said about disagreeing and, and, and if you do, fine, but put a case and argue it coherently. 
have the courage to put the case and then stand by to allow it to be questioned and perhaps disproved if, if necessary or if that's what happens. But um, anyway, so this, uh, this is a Les Paul studio and um, let me just check this. It's about as low as that. It's very low profile. So I'm going to take this down a minute. I want it out of the way. Obviously, I don't want so far it's going to fall out because that will just make more work. Um, but I do want it out of the way. Um, yes, so it's a Gibson Les Paul. It's the studio version, so, so it's one of the ones that doesn't have uh, nibs on the end. And it is, sorry, that's my one end or other of my thing going slightly clunk, but that's fine. Um, and some people kind of want to believe or kind of expect when they come to see a, a setup that maybe they've bought one or they're thinking of buying one, so they, they search Google and they arrive at this and they're hoping in some ways to see a special set of uh, settings that are unique to a Gibson Les Paul. And sometimes people get um, disappointed or angry that they don't find that on mine. You know, my approach is that this is a guitar with the same basic functions as any guitar, just happens to be made by a Gibson and has a, a slightly different history. But it's a wooden neck with frets, with a truss rod, glued to a body, and it obeys the same laws as any other guitar in the same or similar construction. There are some differences, for example, the part of the body where it's glued in here, the truss rod doesn't really respond very much at all. So it has a, a slightly flatter or a deader spot here of the fingerboard. But anyway, so my first passes uh, with the tool revealed to me, um, I would say, OK, OK, low, low, a bit low, OK, OK, low, OK, a bit low, OK, OK, a bit high, OK, low, OK, OK, high, high, lowish. So there's definitely a, a series of ups and downs on this This. A fingerboard under strung loading, which is exactly what you'd expect from any other guitar, including a Gibson Les Paul. Some people want to believe there is something about their Gibson Les Paul that because they paid more money and they bought it from the brand that they hugely respect and so on, that has great cachet, they hope and believe that it has, you know, um, it'll have more lev level, more level, leveler frets than any other kind of guitar they've had or they'll be more accurate. It's not the case. Right, so even though I've got some frets under here that are not yet touched by the, the, uh, the levelling beam, uh, in other words they're still low below the radar you could say, I'm going to continue because as far as I'm concerned all the notes are playing well at this point in time and I'm going to be, I don't mind there being some unevenness, it, it's um, any unevenness below the setting or the action that I've chosen to set is kind of irrelevant to me, I don't really mind. Um, so there's no point chasing it down to absolute level uh, just so I can say I've done it when in fact I don't need it to be absolutely level. Um, so this is okay, it's, it's, low, it's come up a bit here so we've some of the edges do tend to get hammered in lower than other parts of the fret. So by the time we get to the B here, it's looking good, like it's evened out. We haven't got any extremes of levelness. These frets have been played Right, we're going to do the G track and see if we can get rid of some of those as we bend. Um, yeah, these frets have been played a lot, and they are quite flattened anyway. So uh, we're at the point in life of this instrument where the, um, the recrowning might be struggling a bit with the uh, Stumac recrowning file that I've got, um, because that sort of expects a certain youthfulness of fret. Um, and if we don't get it, then it kind of, the edges of the concave 
file touch the fingerboard before it takes any or enough material off the fret to reshape it. So anyway, I'm just saying it might necessitate a re reversion to the three-sided triangular file. Now this is all looking pretty good at this stage. We should be able to get a nice low action out of this, notwithstanding some careful re-crowning. Some people and some companies re-crown the, or re-crown, they, they level the frets at the factory, but they don't re-crown them. Do a little bit more on the G, that's good. We've freed those up mostly. And they're all playing with big bends. They, they, you know, there's room for a tiny bit of improvement, but that's okay. We just keep it. Just kind of, we have to trade off between taking fret metal and going for absolute perfection. So I'm just looking to get the best I can with what we've got here. At the same time, um, what I'm also being able to do, not entirely, but I'm taking most of the fretware, the grooves down here, uh, especially near the, close to the nut. I'm getting rid of most of that at the same point. Now I'm not getting rid of all of it because when fret metal is at a premium, the last thing I want to do is change, I don't believe it's worth change, um, you know, removing fret metal in order to remove what's effectively aesthetic, uh, an aesthetic issue, which is those little bumps on the uh, on the little grooves down here where the open chords, for example, tend to leave uh, those little grooves. So I don't think it's worth um, taking metal off to bottom those out so that there are just, just so we can say there are none, no marks at all. Um, and the reason for that is that it's mostly uh, aesthetic or you know, superficial. It, it's very rare that those marks or those grooves uh, actually interfere with play. So unless they did, I would make clearing them up slightly secondary to the overall purpose, which is leveling the frets. Um, but obviously, while I'm doing this, I'm also taking, paying attention to them and, and making sure that if I can, I'll get rid of the, uh, the damage, the, gro the grooves. So um, in this case, all but one I think I've got rid of, which is pretty good. But that one is a little deeper, and I'm... I say I'm not really going to go hacking away at the fret metal just for the satisfaction of saying it's gone. So, yeah, this is so. What, what what am I doing? This people sometimes ask, what are your specifications then? If you're not doing it to a Fender, uh, Fender Gibson one. My specifications are, I set a 0.3 over the first fret on all strings. I also then aim for 1.5 millimeters at the last fret and crossing over to 1.2, sorry, last fret, low E, and crossing over to, get this back on your thing, crossing over to 1.2 mil on the high E last fret and a, and a kind of approximate spread in between. Of course it's very little change but as long as it's going in the right direction I'm happy with that. So that's pretty low at the last fret and some people will say well why do you measure at the last fret and there's some long-winded boring reasons that are purely subjective and personal why I do it that way and you don't have to do it that way but I can't tell you what what those translate into immediately in 12 fret, fret measurements. So if you want to know that, you'll have to work it out yourself or start with mine and figure it out uh, yourself because it's not important to me to know a thing I don't use, which is the 12th fret measurement. The only time I ever have to use it is when I'm talking to Taylor and I'm getting them to send me some shims for resetting the acoustic guitar necks and they want to know the 12th fret action in uh, the, yeah, the action at the 12th rather than anywhere else, so I have to play the game. Um, so in that case, I tend to measure the guitar first when I get it, and then I measure the 12th fret as, as it presents itself and go from there. 
This is very good. I expected to find a little bit of fret uh, slap on the low E, which I have, but we should get rid of that too. So this has actually been a very, a pretty well-behaved neck to level. Um, that's partly helped by the fact it's been played so much that it's mostly leveled itself over the years, um, which is quite common. Uh, but in doing so, it's it's made the, the frets fairly flat. So we've got a bit of reshaping to do, and hopefully we get it, get to be able to do it with the with the Stumac tool. But if not, we'll revert to the three-sided. What's it? Now, I've got to clean dust and everything off here afterwards, but the last thing I want to do is get rid of those oh-so-important, I'm not being su superficial um, or sarcastic, those oh-so-important signatures, so I have to be very careful to uh, either work around them or only use a cloth and dust it rather than try to clean it. Um, just have to be careful not to take away those things. Okay, it's all looking pretty good. A lot of the decisions about how long do I level this, how, where do I stop and so on, those are very much um, experience based things. The thing I was mentioning just now about the spacing and how well you'll see it on this guitar, I'm just going to hold it down here. Um, there's a view of, I think the Phone camera's pretty much right over the thing now. So you can see there's more room over here. Um, that, that's down to the position. There's absolutely no give in the position of uh, a Les Paul tunematic bridge, unfortunately. With a strat bridge or a hardtail bridge of the strat kind, you can at least pick it up, fill the original holes, move it half a millimeter and replace it. But you can't do that with the Gibson. You have to fill in the original holes Redrill new holes, and that's a, a big deal. Um, entirely possible, takes a lot of time and effort. Let's have a look and a looky feely. Okay, oops. That's actually quite low, isn't it? Let's just hike that up a tiny fraction. I'm good with that. So now I'm going to take these off. Let's use my uh, electric screwdriver speed things along. So doing both of Andy's guitars this weekend. Today the there's Paul, tomorrow the Yamaha acoustic. Come on. So there's a lot of little fiddly stuff to do now, which is changing over the tuners and stuff. So, and we'll we'll take care of that in a minute. Take off our nut, put it to one side, and let's get rid of these strings. The uh, the break angle is a little bit steep on this guitar, so it might be good to put it back with a bit less. In, the, in terms of the break angle between the, uh, the bridge and the stop bar. It doesn't need to be so low. Well, these have been fitted in. That's interesting. Oh, no, OK. We should take them up a little bit, I think. Let's get these out of here, because the gold ones are going. And so are the uh, gold ones of these. Of course, we have to keep the original uh, threads in there, which have actually been one in the case of the stop bars they've been painted over in case of the bridge post they're actually 
um, they're actually sticking out gold. I mean, they'll be hidden mostly, um, but we have to leave them there. I don't want to pull them out. We could get into a lot more damage and fixing if we were to try to hold them out um, and, and fit new ones, unfortunately. And sometimes they might, it might come out, depends on how they were fitted in the first place. So we'll see what it looks like when we put the, the new ones on. Um, and so, yeah, let, let's, get, let's get the tuners off and those, we'll start just changing those things and then looking at the, the cleanup as we go. Got a bit of work on the back to do with, try, I'm going to put a bit of Velcro hopefully on the, um, on the battery compartment in the back so it doesn't rattle around. slack these off. Now the 19 to 1 tuners are slightly heavier but with a Les Paul it's never going to be a head tilting issue. Um, they're heavier but they they do benefit from the better gearing which is the important bit. That's what we were aiming for. So what I'm going to do is find me a, a fine thingy um, probably with one of these so you can reach it better. All the gold ones will come out. Um, I suspect I'll have to. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ream. Ream out the holes a bit bigger because the new ones will not be eight mils. These will be, I expect. So that's just a mechanical thing with a reaming tool which is just a bit time consuming. I've had to do it on two guitars this week. You can set it up for drilling. I prefer not to, especially when it's a, a it's not so bad if it's a, if it's a bolt on neck because you can comfortably get the whole neck, move it through underneath the pillar drill. But if it's a, if it's a, uh, you know, thingy body like this, it isn't going to want to do it. And um, to drill an existing hole, you have to be incredibly accurate and careful. All right, so out come all the original tuners. Look at that. I don't know, I'll show you a bit up close. Look at that gorgeous sort of, I don't know, if I didn't know better, I'd say, look at that gorgeous essence of nicotine. But it isn't, it's just the, well, you know, actually... I think this is interesting. I, Andy says this was white, and if, I suppose if you look right down inside there, you see white, but the, the areas that didn't get the sun, you'd think haven't bleached, so you'd kind of think it was that color, but then again, it's probably more of the color that's underneath, so maybe it is a whole bunch of nicotine that's uh, <laughs> floated about and got stuck under there. Well, whatever it is, let me just get these out of the way a second, sorry. <coughs> Um, whatever it is, whatever it is, um, it's now coming off. So these are nice tuners. I think they're probably about 14 to 1. I think that was around about the 14 or 15 maximum. And these are 19, so that's good. Just a smoother, smoother upgrade. So we got those off. Um, uh, Yes, sometimes it's hard to see. They may not actually be. Do they need, automatically need redoofering? Uh, yes, probably they do. But probably not much. So that's going to be a boring bit of that. Shall I? Shall I not? What shall I do? Yeah, let's, I suppose we better do the mechanical bit. The, the grinding mechanical bit. Yeah, it's a bit... Bit old fashioned, really. This you get the, the reaming thing in, and you do this slice, slice, slice until you get the size you want. There you go. It's just, so it doesn't need that much. They're not that, it may actually not need it. I think it, all I have to do is get rid of the finish that's in there. I think, uh, well, the other way around, yeah. Okay, so only, that's good. So they are the right size holes. So these have got spaces in for 10 mil. Oh, actually, you know what? That's not true. These are different. 
they are look you can see they've got a they've got a big 10 mil thing there so it is only just uh, get rid of the over spray spill stuff which is pretty straightforward well that makes my life somewhat easier wow well, it's got quite a lot of old goo built up in there getting in the way so just testing that yes yes Good, right. So before I put those on at all, what I'm going to do is get a bit of cleaning fluid and um, give that a clean up so we can start from a nice, fresh looking bit of edge stock. I will work downwards with this as well, make sure we get everything else clean, but with the provisor that I take great care when it comes down to the autographs down there. So that's pretty, a fair bit of grime that's built up on there. And a, you know, even a quick clean like this to remove most of it is, a, is an improvement. Let's just flip it over. We'll do the back. Yes, so, uh, you know, Les Paul's are uh, guitars like any, all others. So there's not a, uh, there's nothing about them that screams, you have to treat me any differently. Um, even to the point where, you know, somebody will say, but, but Gibson has a whole load of specs on its Gibson, uh, you know, owner's tech page or whatever and that's fine of course Gibson will give a uh, sort of fairly generic um, what's the word spec for its guitars um, why wouldn't you that's what you know you've made them you you, you would help your customers out with a, a sort of an average spec to you know that would suit perhaps a middling down the middle spec um, and of course that's uh, there's a bit of yellow coming off there. That's interesting. Um, you know that 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 will probably, by definition, always be a middling, safe middling spec, because you know you won't cater for everybody in one go. So um, it's actually hard to clean around these letterings. They've obviously been left alone in the past. So we'll leave them alone in the present. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so. Um, Yes, yes, you know, you expect Gibson to give a spec, and that's fine. But of course, action settings are, at the best of times, incredibly um, subjective anyway. So, um, you know, what one player likes, another player may not, and so on. So I always uh, advise treating it as a start point. So, you know, you may hate the low action that I set, um, which is totally fine if you do, and therefore, you know, you won't choose that for your guitar. But, um, you know, I base it on what my customers tend to want, tend to want, tend to want, and my customers usually want a low light action. And my experience has shown that, um, that the figures I just gave you were, uh, they fall nicely into what my customers usually like. I'm just going to do a quick look over the back here. I'm not going to fill these, oh god am I, yeah I do need to, I was going to say I'm not going to fill these existing holes in but I think I have to. And the reason why is that the next hole for this one comes in, on each one comes in almost spot on the, uh, I don't know if you can see, that one, that one's okay to hide or just leave hidden but this one here, it's too close, see that through the, I don't know if you can see it, through the the hole on the black one 
in that. It's close enough and I, I want it filled so it had something to bite against. So with that in mind, I'm going to put that over here, put a lid on that for a minute and go and get me my tried and tested. Uh, damn, I've just knocked a load of a bit of vital foam down the back. <laughs> My square of foam. Sorry about that. I've got this big cupboard that I put here with now it's absolutely chock a block with stuff. And the problem is, is things fall down behind her, and I know I'm never going to see them again until I unload the entire cupboard, uh, pull it right out, and discover all these things I thought were long gone. But I guess it has to be done some day when I've got absolutely nothing else to do. You know, one of those days, you know what I mean. Anyway. So I'm sort of filling all these holes first with thing, um, and then I'll cut pieces of wood to go in, and then we'll tap them in, then we'll trim them back, and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to bother painting them. I'll just keep them filled in so that they are less, not so visible. Anyway, yeah, so Gibson's and any other guitars. So yeah, Gibson will have a spec. I've got a target spec that I like. What I can tell you about a Les Paul usually Les Paul, you can very often get at 1.5 mils, and it's got a lot to do with the radius. Um, a Les Paul radius, 12 inch radius, is a slightly flatter radius than your Strats and Tellys, and certainly more than your vintage Strats and Tellys, which te can be quite rounded. And as a result, or it tends to be, that the, the flatter the, um, the flatter the radius, the, uh, the lower the action you can get. Um, so, for example, on on uh, guitars with very tight radii, uh, such as vintage Strats, um, it is often the, blimey, the case that um, you can't get below a certain action, even if you want it, um, just because uh, the um, the sort of geometry of the of the radius doesn't allow it. So, with a with a, an action, sorry, with a with a vintage Strat, you might be have to play a little bit higher, but certainly with a, the action I've just set on here with a um, Les Paul with its 12-inch radius, usually no problem at all to get it to set at the action I've chosen. Um, if uh, if the action is is seems to be sorry, if the radius seems to be too tight and you can't get to the desired action without um, buzzing. Um, there's a temptation, well sometimes it's the case that you can lo level a bit more and, and, and by leveling out you can uh, you can get that action to play. But if you know you're starting with a, a, a tight radius then you'll know, you'll be, you should know straight away that you won't really have the chance to get it to the ultra low action, a tight radius, particularly 7.25 like on the vintage strats, just will not go there. So never try to get to the 1.5 and 1.2. Just always start from a bit higher or settle for a bit higher, I should say. And then once you've, you know, you, you just know it won't. It's not It's not your bad leveling or your terrible setup skills. It is literally a, a constraint of the geometry involved. So those are my uh, fills. The good thing about the glue, of course, is it's it's type one wood glue, so it's going to stay uh, liquid for ages yet. And so I've got plenty of time to go across, get me some kitchen roll, come back, uh, snip off the bits that I don't want, and then um, I can I don't have to wait for this glue to dry or anything. Um, I'm just going to throw this on the floor and sweep them up later. Actually, I could probably do it chopping these. This is uh, me using these fret pullers actually for a slightly different in purpose. I'm just They're great for snipping off flush uh, things like these uh, toothpick things and they go right to the surface. So don't really, if I don't want to, I don't have to do any scraping with a knife after this. So just whiz through and cut it all back out the way. 
Um, yes, so yeah, the Gibsons, they are a guitar. And of course, some, there will be some people who uh, will kind of go on forever at that, that as if a Gibson should need some sort of special treatment that some other guitar doesn't get. And I understand that, you know. It's easy to fall into that because you're, you know, you're kind of obsessed with the guitar. You, you know, you bought it because you love it. You've invested time and your money into it and you care about it. And, you know, a lot of times it's, it's also tied up with people's um, identity, self-identity. So it's quite easy to understand how um, that becomes kind of hyper important. Um, but there is, there is nothing about the Gibson that is so unusual uh, that I would have to do, or you would have to do anything different with it than you would do with any other kind of guitar. Um, sometimes in videos, some you know, people who are, as I've mentioned, you know, understandably totally fascinated or obsessed with a particular brand and model of guitar will come along and they will get really annoyed with me if I don't. I am, by the way, I'm, I am trimming these back because they are a little bit proud. They might, they come and get really pissed off with me because I, I don't know the exact model number of the guitar I'm working on, um, or I don't, um, I don't know, I, I don't know m enough about the player, for example, whose signature it is or whatever. Um, and I understand people feeling like that because you know they, they've lived and breathed this guitar and that player and it's you know it, it, it would be hard for them to imagine not knowing those things about it um, but of course it doesn't matter to me I don't it doesn't make any much difference to me if I ever know what the model number is on this guitar or not other than um, it's useful to be able to search for it and just check you know the specs i.e. what it's made of what the neck uh, is made of or so on and so forth um, or what the radius is and so on. You know, those kinds of things are, are useful to know. But they're, apart from useful information, they're not critical to doing what I'm doing. So, um, you know, I, I don't need to know. And it, it really isn't, um, it isn't disrespect. You know, it's just it's non-essential information. Because it doesn't change... I don't have to know anything about any of them. I could, it won't make any difference to how I set the guitar up. I'll just have to you know, discover what the... Ra uh, look at me doing upside down, for God's sake. I have to discover what the, uh, what the, the radius is. Um, in my, you didn't even notice me doing that, did you? Uh, yeah, I'll discover the radius um, by checking it while it's here rather than finding it online. So no big deal. Um, anyway... So, why? It, how is a Gibson different from anything else? Uh, when I pick up three, um, oh, done it again. Like, when I pick up three tuners, I hope that one of the three is w one that goes on the opposite side, because it tells me then I have got a three-a-side set. Um, if I don't, if I get, if I occasionally I pick the first three I pick up, all go to the one side. And then I'm convinced that the next one is also going to be f for that side as well, which means I've bought a right-handed set instead of a three side. But thankfully, that isn't the case. Okay, so when you're doing fills on little bits of wood like this, you don't obviously you really don't have to worry about the glue drying. It will now dry over time. There's nothing, there's nothing about it that we need to wait for. Um, it's. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a fill, really. To, 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 yeah, fill in the gap. So, if I can get these nuts on there, a little bit grindy. Why aren't you going on? I have to go to the other side and make it work. Uh. 
Um, I cannot believe it. That's amazing. It looks like my my fingernail has actually put a slight scratch on the finish. Can you believe it? After polishing it up. So I'm going to take this off a minute and I'm just going to polish this with some car polish stuff. It's not a bad thing to do anyway, but I, my, my nail has, the edge of my finger has actually caused that to happen. Can you believe it? That will teach me. Do it the other way up next time. Excuse me. Right, so what I'll do is I'll get me cloth and, excuse me, the G3 compound and I will Let's use another, let's use this bit here. I don't want a good bit of cloth to begin with. Right, I'm just going to get a little bit of this compound and just clean this back up. The only sort of, uh, I suppose, what do you call them? Finger, certain, like scra scrapes, if you scrape with it, your fingernail, it's actually more like your fingernail coming off on the finish rather than denting the finish. But gives me a chance to just clean this up then. This is G3 compound, so it's stuff you would use. For, but is, I think that one is a car compound, but it's good, good stuff. I use it every year. I go down and do my the glass over, or the plastic over my headlights with it um, before it goes to the MOT, the car goes to the MOT. And they say, sorry sir, we failed on the fact that we couldn't couldn't uh, the light the light glass wasn't translucent enough, clear enough. There we go. Alright, let's start again. Come on, there's bits of that compound coming off, right? Now this time I'm going to do it up from this side. Like so. Something tells me it ain't biting. For God's sakes. Doesn't want to make contact. Thank you. Sorry about the squeakings. Um, which way around is this? That's that way. So we'll drill pilot holes in a minute as well for the uh, for the new screw holes in the back. One per tuner, which is fine. I was doing reading on them um, online about the uh, <laughs> poor old Phoebe Waller Bridge. Have you seen the reviews for the? Um, uh, What's his name? Indiana Jones reviews. <laughs> Absolutely. I've never seen, I've never heard, read such universally bad reviews for a film. Um, I haven't seen it. I'm a very, I'm impossible to please with, in terms of modern films, so <sighs> you won't get me going to see it, especially since it's got bad reviews. But, um, uh, Let's just try and line these up so they're nice and pretty. So what we don't want, we want to follow the line a little bit, but not completely. It's funny they don't they don't line up the same as the uh, the original ones did. They're slightly different spread. So let me just have a look at this up against the bright light. No, 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 no. That looks good. Down there a bit. Up there a bit. Down there a bit. It's very difficult to get exactly right. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Something like that. It's not technically right, but it's how it looks right. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, 
poor girl. I mean, she's she was what did well in that flea bag thing that she wrote and starred in. And I know she's, or well, I heard that she'd written some. Was it some? She wrote some episodes of Eve, and she wrote some James Bond. Some of the James Bond script as well, I believe. Anyway, does so she seem to be doing great in her career? And uh, you know, it was, it was kind of onwards and upwards. Um, and then along came this film, and uh, I think, well, first of all, it does seem to have been an absolute. It does seem to be a complete horror of a film, um, and it's it's described by some people as, uh, you know, it's been woked to death. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, but what is evidently true is the fact that it's, um, you know, it does, apparently it seems to get off on um, portraying Indiana Jones as a helpless, bumbling old duffer uh, and her as the kind of, the pretty, well, she seems to call herself a beautiful young thing who comes along and gets him out of trouble every time. Um, and apparently it's it, that aspect of it, um, of constantly ridiculing Indy, which is, who is obviously a much loved character for all the old folks of my age who grew up with it, or that, that original story, you know, to, to kind of come along and rubbish that character just and simply appear to just portray him as a as a burned out old fart. Probably not a smart move if you want to kind of please the some of the original fans of the franchise as they would call it. Anyway, they don't seem to have thought about that and they've gone ahead and uh, made him seem like a complete, complete helpless fool. Um, and it, they've done it to him at the expense of her, who they've made to seem like, you know, given almost superhuman powers. Now, I suppose you could argue that, in a sense, they, they all already... I mean, <laughs> Indiana Jones was what it was because they'd given this one <laughs> quirky, curmudgeonly... Uh, explorer those same kind of impossible powers of survival being able to have a fist fight on a nazi I don't know, stealth bomber or whatever the hell it was you know he seemed to be indestructible so they they appear to have just mapped those powers across to him um sorry to her instead of him but there's something about it which it, it feels well, according to all the reviewers is a pretty bad in bad taste they say you know um but anyway it's it it's apparently gone down like a lead balloon and um there was i did see an interview with uh harrison ford and he came out from he was coming out of a um premiere or something and somebody sort of caught him on the hop and said harrison where would you like to most like to be in the world right now and he looked at this interviewer and his expression where there was no there was no friendliness or oh hi you know interested media person i better schmooze with you a little bit because that's part of the game he just looked at her and said home like like and and there was never a truer sounding thing ever said you really believed it that he wanted to kind of disappear and you know fall into a hole in the ground bless him but you know but i, I was talking with, with Clara about this today and thinking, you know, what what could it have been that, can you imagine poor old Phoebe Waller-Bridge having, you know, being in a way the golden girl of British film uh, to, to a point, and certainly British TV series or whatever, I mean, she, she couldn't do any wrong. And then imagine how awful it would be to come out of the this particular escapade and and just have to live with the, the awful reviews you were getting i mean how how awful it must be you must you know I, I can imagine well i think i can imagine harrison ford sort of getting past 
you know, getting over it by, you know, oh, well, look, come on, I'm old enough and I've done all these things. This is the end of my career and I'll just forget it ever happened, maybe. But I can't see some, it must be, it must, uh, for Phoebe Waller-Bridge, it, it may well be, I can imagine, it's um, hugely difficult. And I've just realised, of course, um, that with this... Um, I am going to need a different thread. This is no use, is it? He said, like an Egypt. This is a uh, a thingy thread. So it may be that I have to pull these out, um, but the paint has gone all the way around it, so getting them out without damaging paint that could be quite a something. So obviously, um, replacing these now is not going to turn out to be as easy as first thought. Um, let's see what the state of the paint on here is. Um, yeah, that comes off fairly easily. Uh, well, I think we're going to have to pull them. They should be pullable. However, I don't have the black ones kicking around. They didn't supply the black ones, so I might have to buy those. It's funny, actually. Right. Typical. Here's me thinking it'd be easy. All right, let's um, let's put that on the hold. Well, I figure that one out. Let's put away some of these the gold Gibson tuners. If they fit in this bag, will they fit? Just about. Yeah. Anyway, I just uh, that's what I really thought uh, more than anything I just felt sorry for Phoebe Waller Bridge you know thinking I hope she I hope she is able to take it in a good spirit and get back, get over it because um, that's a pretty pretty distressing um, you know to be to be involved so early in your career in such a big flop uh, is not nice at all anyway I guess it's what doesn't kill fattens or something like that. All right, so while I'm here, while I think about my options, um, uh, let us now do the re-crowning of these frets and see what is the score. So um, I will first of all mark them up again with marker pen and we'll see how they are, uh, they find the Stumac version of the re-crowning file. Um, Otherwise, we'll, if it doesn't work, we'll revert to the hand, oh, well, they're all hand tools, but we'll revert to the uh, three-sided file. But, yeah, these were quite flat to begin with. I mean, it didn't take much off in the way of actual metal, so uh, let's have a look. Ah, oh, yes, why didn't I think um, of Imperial versus, what you call it? I didn't think, did I? Probably could. It's been a while since I've upgraded a Gibson, or if, if at all. Right, so what I'm going to do is let's try the medium side of this thing. Uh, that's not so bad. So these have been flattened down before by either by leveling somewhere or just playing. So it might take a little bit longer than usual just to restore the fret tops to as close to a um, thin line as possible. Uh, that's not bad, actually. Um, yes. I think, we'll, I think they're all much of a muchness, these frets, so I think it'll be a fair bit of working to re-crown them. But worth doing because it re replay uh, rearranges the what you might call the intonation point of the fret, which is supposed to be right in the centre. Um, whereas when they flatten out, it moves towards the bridge end, not, not the Welsh city town. But anyway. um, so what I'll do in a minute when I've done this is I will. Um, see if I can lift up the uh, the 
things. Let's see if I can lift up the uh, posts. Um, I'm just going to also check with this one whether it's done in a US or Imperial. I've got a feeling this... Is this a, no, this is a... See, that's a... That's a different one altogether as well. So that's a... So we'd have to get an extra one. Anyway, oh well. I mean, we could... Well, we could use... I suppose we could use this original one, but... That would fit on there like that, but we still end up with gold in the way. Uh, hmm. I'll check. I'll check before I make any rash decisions. Okay, let's get back to the re-crowning. Um, yes. So that I'm definitely not going to be any chance of me going to the cinema to see Indiana Jones. But then I wouldn't anyway. Um, I, th I can't stand things that are taken and exploited past the point of uh, their sale by date. And apparently what I was learning from reading that is that this, this, this Kathleen Kennedy, Catherine Kennedy, Kathleen or Catherine Kennedy, and she's a, I think she's a Disney executive who kind of does the commissioning or you know, decides on the projects that go ahead, film projects for Disney, and apparently everything she touches is turning to garbage at the moment. So, um, and including this this Indiana Jones thing. So nobody, no critic of hers is surprised at how badly it's gone, um, and how badly it's gone down in the box office. So. Anyway, I hope that uh, Harrison Ford could uh, get over it and bow out somewhat gracefully and, and hopefully be able to get a sense of perspective and chuckle about it on any guest show sofas that he goes on. Um, and Phoebe Waller-Bridge, uh, let's hope somebody who cares about her gives us some this is some real tough and honest feedback about what people don't want from cinema, especially where it involves classic stories that, you know, in a sense, come from a different era. I think that's a, it used to be that remaking things was possible because we didn't we didn't have quite such a rapidly changing environment of what is or isn't acceptable and. That seems to be now so unstable that, you know, 10 years later, something that you'd make now, 10 years later, can be, you know, just deemed just totally unacceptable, which is mad. But, you know, you used to be able to fairly safely remake something 50 years later in the olden days and get away with it. But things change, but... But a lot of the things just should never be remade. Personally, I've never seen a remake that I've liked better than the original. Um, uh, but I'm probably, you know, probably, I'm almost certainly not your target modern movie goer, which I am absolutely not. Um, I mean, for example, I, what did I see like, I, a little while back? I saw. Um, a great favourite of mine was Man for All Seasons with Paul Schofield and um, uh, Robert Shaw, amongst others. And uh, you know, it's it's a, just a fantastic book. I mean, it's from sorry, play. It's a fantastic script straight from the play, really. I mean, it's as as word perfect almost as you can get. And uh, it was played by Schofield and uh, Martin Shaw beautifully. But Schofield had been playing it in theatre for a long time, apparently, before he they made it into the film. So it was, you know, he was 100% in the character before he even started filming. So, um, 
So it's, you know, it's not surprising it benefited from that, that familiarity. And uh, I saw it remade um, with Charlton Heston. Well, I wouldn't. I, I found it on YouTube somewhere, and I thought as a you know mid-afternoon snooze film, I thought, go on, let's let's see if they let's see what they can do with my favourite. And actually, in a sense, I was a little bit surprised because it wasn't as terribly bad as I expected. And I think it wasn't so bad because Heston clearly worked his socks off to make it a, a decent enough uh, version. You know, uh, he was he was a you know he considered himself a, a serious enough actor to take the project very seriously, and and so he did. You know, the thing that struck me straight away was that the, the script was identical, um, were almost almost verbatim for the original one, um, and and so with that fantastic script, you hardly could go wrong anyway. So, um, and then it came down to who played it better, and I just think the original characters were far better, including um, including uh, Paul Schofield's version of Thomas More, which was just wonderful. Anyway, but at the same time, it, Charlton Heston's version wasn't bad as such, and I couldn't find a lot of fault with it. But at best, it was left me thinking, well, you nearly did as well. You know, you nearly, you did, you did it proud. Um, it wasn't, it was good for what it was, but with the original to live up to, it, it wasn't as good as the original, because I'm biased because I prefer the original because I saw it before and so on and so forth and then the only question that comes out of it is actually it points back to the actor or the, the you know the push behind it which is obviously Charlton Heston wanting to you know, presumably he thinks it needs or thinks it can be bettered by the application of his unique and special talents and then suddenly when you start to think well why did you do this version of it then you the, the person whose idea it was leaves himself wide open for sort of uh, accusations of conceit or something hubris. I don't know. You know, there's no real reason to do it. So obviously you think you're better, and therefore, actually, in the end, you weren't better. You were pretty good, um, but you haven't added anything really significant new to the world, and you've only gone to show that it was a great play, it's a fantastic screenplay, and. Actually, the first one was superb, and and yours was okay. But there's no real push. To, you know, the world doesn't need another one. And it was. It's then you suddenly realise that it can only be driven by Charlton Heston's ego as an actor or as a creative. You know, which is which is a bit of a shame, really. It's a lot of time and effort to waste pursuing somebody's ego or the desire to prove to the world they can do it, they think they can do it better. Now these last three frets on this guitar appear to be um, quite pretty flat. Uh, there's not going to be an awful lot of, uh, um, it's going to be tricky to level these with any method. You can probably just see them there. I've got the other ones mostly done. I'll get there with these, but you know, they They've been hit quite hard on the ends, so it's a, it's a fairly tricky. And in this case, really, it's now down to just the best you can do, really, um, to make as, as arch shaped a fret as possible out of what's already a fairly flat fret. Thanks. So once I've done this and Andy's Yamaha acoustic tomorrow, then into the next week I've got Adam's, uh, I'm sort of rebuilding his uh, twin humbucker telly. It's not exactly a thin line telly, but it's a tw twin humbucker telly. And I'm going to rewire that as a uh, Jimmy Page wiring, 
which is going to be fun because it's going to risk a lot. Oops, a lot of um, there's going to be a lot of wire in there involved. So. Yeah, I think I think I am at the limits of how much more I can crown this. I think that's where we're at. That's the extent of it. Not as bad actually as I thought. I think we'd have to revert to the other device sooner. But okay. So the next thing I'm going to do, I'm just looking at these frets. We did notice the the thing has shrunk a bit thing being the, the fretboard and so there is a bit of fret sprout here um, and I don't think it's over the top here that's quite smooth as it happens so I think what I need to do is I need to just do all of the edges here like so right before we put the masking tape on and get into rounding everything off so it's just taking these little sharp corners out now um, before we start sanding Um, yeah, what, that, so what was the other one I saw? I think I saw a remake of 12 Angry Men. Um, and that was done with great reverence for the original and for the script. Um, and again, it, it worked because, or it was, it was watchable because they, they just didn't try and depart from the original. You know, they, they, were, they, they knew the original was good and they just remade it with different actors to bring sort of a different set of personalities within the character definitions, I suppose. Um, and as a result, it was, again, a bit like the remake of uh, Man Four Seasons. It was, in its own right, watchable. Um, it, you know, it was a, a credible performance, you could say. But as a, as a thing standing against the original the question of why was again would come out um to which question i have no serious answer anyway but then there have been other remakes which i, I suppose they, they were so different that and i haven't seen that many now i can think of it but there have been remakes that are so different that that at least it's not a bad thing, but at least you're not feeling like you're comparing a mirror, almost mirror copy or a carbon copy of the same thing. So I think of what did I see? Um, something like uh, the the time machine was redone, wasn't it, with um, Guy Pearce? Um, well, it was it was done once with David Warner and somebody else. I've forgotten who was the main forgotten who the lead was. Oh, the lead was David Warner, wasn't it? He wasn't a baddie in that. He was the, I think he was the guy. Anyway, uh, but there's one with Guy Pearce and Samantha Mumba, who was a, a nod to the Wiener character of the original. But um, I, I, I suppose it was interesting in its own right. I didn't, it didn't, I suppose the danger of that is then you, you have a problem where if you if you make it very different, that's good because you're not just not trying to duplicate the original, which leaves leaves you open to the question of why bother. And then the other the downside of it is um, then you then you can obviously be judged against the original to say, well, was this one even worth bothering with? <laughs> you know, um, and that leaves you open for. Uh, some criticism and as is the case with the time machine with Guy Pearce if it was called even that I can't remember now um, it was it tried to bring in a part of the story um, and not not just traveling in time which I suppose for the original Victorian audience was spectacle enough the thought of going somewhere in time but in the in the Guy Pierce one, they tried to bring in the sort of uh, um, back to the future -y type thing where you try and change something that some trauma that's happened and you don't want something bad to happen and you, you know, you try, 
try and use your power to move through time to, to put it right and and mess up the space time continuum and all that stuff that usually happens um, so that that was the sort of what characterized the, that remake and I think it I'm not sure it worked for me but um, Mind you, the original, I have to say, the original Time Machine film doesn't really work for me either. Um, it, it's far weaker for my liking than the book. Even though the book is, you know, it's very child childlike. It's very basic reading level sort of book. That's not fair, actually. But it's not a complex, it's not a hard language book. Um, it's not a very challenging read, we say, in terms of language. But um, the, the film, I think, was the George Powell film in the fifties. Was um, had it had Rod uh, Rod Thingy, Rod Major, no Rod Serling, no Rod Major. He was a guy I used to network in business with. <laughs> Rod Major, uh, Rod, Australian guy, not Laver, the tennis player, Rod. Oh my goodness, Rod. You know who I mean. He well, this has shrunk quite a bit. So, tailoring, or t taming, taming this resin sticky upness is, a, is quite hard. But we'll get there. Um, Rod. Taylor. So who he was, Rod Taylor. <laughs> um, yeah, Rod Taylor. And he apparently wasn't a massively well-respected actor, generally speaking. Um, and it wasn't a very serious film role. I was you know, playing alongside this, the little people and um, the Eloy and the wicked slug-like, no, mole-like, what do they call them? Morlocks. They're underground livers. Anyway. <laughs> so not a lot of, uh, not a lot of other human beings to play off in that, in that film. But even then, it did capture something of the sort of, thank you, something of the sort of quaint times of the early of the original of the story the turn of the century England but, so I, I think the time machine could be done again um, but you'd have that question is would you do it justice by making it ha oops making it happen the same as it did the first time you know, as keeping it absolutely strict, strictly to the script and the, the original story, or would you attempt to pay homage to it and give it a twist? And I'm not really sure whether what you could do, whether you could do it any justice, up, upgrading it or updating it. Be kind of a fun mental exercise to imagine how you'd do it if you did. I mean, the funny thing is, is when you read the um, the Time Machine, you discover that a lot less happens in it than you think does, um, and I think that's partly confused, compounded by the film. So I don't know if you remember the film where it shows him, time traveller, sort of sitting in his, oh blimey, <sighs> Ooh, sort of foam stuff in here has ceased to exist. Oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy, it's turned into, turned into dust. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Um, yeah, so in the, in the film, he, if you remember, he, if you can remember, he stops the time machine in, I think in the 60s, um, and gets out.
Uh, yeah, he gets out out of the time machine in the 60s when a nuclear war is just starting. Um, which is very unrealistic, of course. Can you believe, can you imagine, I didn't know this, but can you imagine Gibson using small pots? Really? Maybe. They do, did, did do, they did do. Anyway, yeah, so, the, so the, in the time machine, he, in the film, he gets out and he stops in about 19. Well, first of all, he, he sort of follows, um, he kind of looks at the shop and he looks at the window of the shop opposite him and... Uh, he, uh, what does he do? He watches the ch the fashions change over a period of time, which which keep fascinates him greatly. Now, if I put this thing on here, I stick it to stick it to the back, then um, there isn't going to be anything to hold it there later when it's when it's run out again, um, unless this was attached to something. But it's going to bounce around otherwise, unless I put something. Uh, else in there. <sighs> mm -hmm. Well, let's just let's put half of this in just to keep it out of trouble. And I'll stick the other half in, and then Andy, you can use this other half at another day when the next battery conks. Um, we shall put that on there. This one here. What am I doing? Stick that there for a minute. <laughs> Stick that on there. No. Samuel, what are you doing? You're trying to do this, Sam. Is it this way or that way? It's this way. You want to do that on there, and you want to do that on there, like so. <laughs> and that will then. You did it the wrong way. You did it the wrong way, didn't you? You great. Why is that? Oh, that's because I got it that way. You did it on the outside. Why didn't anyone warn me about that? <coughs> can you be that? Can you really be that dopey? Yes, you can. Something like that. Right, while I'm at it, then I'm going to remove, change over this plate um yes so so the, in the story he gets out in 1960 and uh and sort of walks about um he watches this the the shop change across the years and then stops in 1960 gets out and, and just as he stops nuclear war is declared um <laughs> which is funny um and he happens to be there just as the mushroom clouds fall down and uh, war breaks out. But thankfully he's able to rush back in before the fallout gets him and leap onto his machine and go forward into the future. Um, and then he sort of, he, he travels the rest of the journey then after that sort of weird stop in the 1960s. Um, he travels into the future and where he stops in the place where he ends up having his, oh God, it's filthy, his his adventures. Oh man, this foam is prehistoric. There goes a screw. I shall have to go hunting for that one. One of four. Um, right, so what I'm going to do is take off this thing and replace it with the black one. Yeah, anyway, so he does his, um, he gets back on, goes to the future, and then the rest of it sort of happens in the, f the far flung future time with the, uh, the character that he meets called Wiener. Um, and I'm never sure in the book how long it is. He tells you in the book how long it is, but I'm not sure how long it feels in the film. It's very hard to tell. But in the book, it's he's, he's I think he's eight days in the future or seven days, seven or eight max. 
Anyhow, um, but when you see the film, or sorry, when you read the book after having seen the film, you you sort of get a feeling that um, you get a feeling that a lot's happened, and then you sort of realise. Um, uh, I realise that a lot of what I f get now when I read the book is probably borrowed from the film. My impression of it being more time travelling than uh, than you actually do experience, because in the book he doesn't really tell you about any of this stuff. In the, he doesn't stop and see the nuclear war and all that malarkey. He just goes. He looks around his work laboratory a bit, notices things speeding up, and then he buggers off to the future. Um, whereupon he lands in the world where he meets his little friend and gets stuck in with the Morlocks and whatnot. But so it's a. Uh, it's not much. There's not much investigating. There's no paradox. There's not much of the paradox of time being explored or played around with, which I think would is quite telling, really, because in the days of the Victorian turn of the century, just the end of the Victorian era, it seemed to for H. 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 G. Wells, just presenting travelling in time was enough. Just the very fact that he went somewhere in time and met someone and had an adventure. That was clearly enough. Um, now, here's the fun part. I got to try and now discover what happened to the little screw. Where could it have gone? Well, annoyingly, doesn't appear to be anywhere obvious. It's except if it's picked it up and I don't know about it. No, junk, 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 but not the junk I want. Well, I'll get another gold one from my collections, but it's annoying when something doesn't have that far to fall, but it manages to fall in a way that becomes lost and totally invisible. Except there it is. Found by accident. How about that? Oh yes. So what I'm going to do in a minute, I've done this bit, I'm going to take a break, mask off the neck with, what's the thing I'm going to mask it off with? Oh yes. That stuff. Um, masking tape. So I can get ready to polish the frets out. And then I'll go off camera to do that and I'll also do my little experiment see whether I can stand any chance of removing those metric sorry in, imperial plugs the problem is you could probably buy an expensive roller bridge with the imperial studs um, I mean if necessary I can always look for another one because I can always use a black roller bridge um, but I didn't think of it when I ordered, so that was that was my mistakes. That uh, dust stuff is pretty hideous. It's stuck to everything, and it's kind of almost made it made itself like a, a dye or something. It really was. Gone me how many years that's been in there. <coughs> okay, <coughs> over you go. Right, so break. Um, I'll mask this all off and then I'll see you a bit later. Here we go. Frets recrowned as you know, um, polished, sanded and polished out, nut glued in, um, everything ready to go for restringing. Now what I'm obviously going to do is I'm going to have to go and search for some uh, of these uh, versions in black. So I've got black hardware but we're obviously just going with the, the gold inserts at the moment because they're and what I also don't want to do is to really I don't want to take a Gibson thing and put in metric ones instead because it's better it stays as a Gibson. So I'm going to look for some conversions or some black ones in uh, Imperial. Um, and actually it, it just sort of depends you know because you will get them in black, but I have a feeling they'll be 
much expensiver. So we'll sort of check and see um, check what Andy would prefer. So everything done as intended. Um, ready now to string up and stretch the strings out and then set the intonation. Um, so I did a very small adjustment on this bridge because it was uh, the I think the um, the spacing on the imperial what's it is a bit wider, um, so I needed to just slightly out over drill the posts on here. That's that's fine. Oh, blimey, these are rusty. These strings. Oh, I'll put them on for now, but I don't have any 1056. That's not good. That's not good at all. I don't know where you got these from. Uh, I'll try and take some pictures of them. Um, God, that's not good. They are properly rusty. They shouldn't be in a sealed pack. Hmm. All right, let's, let's get some close-ups. This isn't good. Um, can you see? Not good at all. I will put them on for now, um, but perhaps I'll have to order some in and we'll change them again afterwards. But not good. <laughs> oh, bloody hell. Anyway, that's Ernie Ball for you. I don't know. I mean, they may have been sat sitting around for years. Um, when it comes down to this end with an adjustable nut, this is for Andy as much as anyone really, with the adjustable nut. What I recommend when you come to restring is the, the adjustable nut can move, uh, it can come out. So I suggest you start with the, the D and the G first. So pull them up tight first of all, pull them all the way through, and then pull them back one fret's worth, and then start winding on, which I should have got the electronic spanner thing, screwdriver. And so uh, as you come around, push, hold up, hold the held string taut. Put the make sure the loose one goes under the held string the first time round, and then as it comes round again, pull up the loose string so it's sticking up, and then push the taut one underneath the loose one. As it comes round, I'm going to go and get the screwdriver version, and then bring it under tension. Screwdriver, please. Um, yeah, that's a, a real shame about those strings. You know, you've paid not it's fair. I mean, I don't know how old they are, but you know, you have paid a fair amount of money for a set of strings, and you do not want them to be rusty when you take them out of the pack. Boom. Anyway, so we're going to also now go on the the G, the rusty G, rusty G, and we pull it through, tension it up, pull it back one fret, hold it down. What I'm going to do is keep it held down while we wind. Opposite way. Let it go over the loose string to begin with. And as the loose one comes around, yank it up. Keep this under tension all the time. And direct it underneath. And that keeps a, a useful minimum amount of um, string on the post, but not too much, not too little. So then, once we've done the, the two centre ones, then we can move on to the other ones. And a good thing to do is, when you take them off as well, take them off in the same sequence, or sorry, reverse sequence. Um, and that way, you'll make sure that the adjustable part of the nut doesn't jump off and spring around, because it's got a little piece of brass in there, which is also loose. It doesn't matter while it's pinned down, but if you if it comes off and you lose it, it could be annoying. So let me put this under. Strings are very, very rusty. They're very rusty. Anyway, I'll probably have to order some new one, new ones in. But we shall see. We'll see where we go with it. Quick that round. It's 
So obviously I've taken off the bridge and moved things around a bit, so we have to just figure out where it's going to sit at its correct height. You know, it's taller, I think, all round than the original bridge, so we won't know. Oh, it's a little bit taller. We shall see if it works. It could be the next little miniature disaster that it doesn't fit, or it's too tall. heavy bottom end I've got to say <laughs> right. so what I'm looking for is the height at that end just now that's fine, fine, fine. Let's cut off the excess, get rid of the paperwork. Uh, I, th I know it's probably not bother, not worth trying to go back and request new ones. But I think they ought to be ashamed of themselves. Thing is with uh, these, they don't, unless I'm mistaken, they don't have the um, what do you call it, silica gel in there, do they? They just have the sealed foil thing. It seems like not to be working terribly well. Okay, that's actually this this bridge has actually balanced out the strings on the neck. Very pleased with that. Um, let's have a check on the string height. This end. Okay. I think we're just about there. Yep. Let's let's do do it up. I hope it doesn't just break other rusty spots. So the thing that I always go on about now is that tuning stability is all about two things, your nut and the slack in your strings. Nothing to do with your tuners. I think I, I think I balanced that just right. That's just how it needs to be. It's a tiny bit inlaid on the inside of here, but the balance is right for the high E's, and it's tidied up at this end here. Right, let's just get this in ch tune. Okay, so now, uh, so a string playing st tuning stability while you're playing is down to the, the quality of your nut, what it's made of, um, most importantly that the slots are smooth running, and the amount of unreleased slack in your strings. Consider it 50% in each, so half and half. So get the nut right first, which we've done here, um, and then the next bit to do is to take care of the um, 
stretch of the strings. Now let me just um, just wipe my hands with something a minute because I'm getting grime on my fingers from the rusty strings I think but I don't want them on my fingers while I'm stretching the strings. Thank you. Right, so stretching technique. Grab the string between your thumb and forefingers and push so that the bending is all here, not at the edges. You're not bending it round a post or something. You're stretching it against itself or against your thumb, which is actually quite painful. You can get plastic tools for kind of going up and down and bending the strings, but I find it breaks, when I tried it, it broke more strings than doing it this way. Although you, the good thing is you can't feel it, so it doesn't hurt your fingers the way this does. Bad thing is, because you can't feel it, you, you can quick break strings quicker because you don't know, you're not feeling how much force you put into the thing. Okay, so just stretching out the strings with the thumb and forefinger technique. And then we'll expect then to hear it uh, out of tune, which we do. Retune. didn't move at all. It actually um, leveled the tuning out pretty quick. That grime is coming off on my hands. Staying in tune now. Good. I'm just going to check the uh, action one more time. Let me just move a couple of things to get at things. You go over there, you go there, you go there, you come here. I don't usually know, use this little thing. For, I haven't used it for a while. It's actually quite a nice little um, tool for measuring the action. I can see it very well anyway. Mm-hmm. I'm going to raise up the base side a little bit. Now, which way does it go to raise it up? This way, isn't it? Surely it's this way. Surely it's this way. Okay. Um, those those strings are grimy. <coughs> so what I've done is in balancing it, because this thing is faulty anyway, and there's no way of correcting it. Whoops! 
Sorry. Oh, what a terrible view. <laughs> oh, that's all got to be overhead shots. Um, yeah, because this, um, because the alignment on this is bad anyway. What I've done is I've privileged the base side. Sorry, the travel travel side up here. But what it's done is it's it's equalised it down here, which is where it needs a bit. To, it needs to be equalised. So there's a little bit, <coughs> a little bit in favour of the treble side here, which you probably want for vibrato anyway. Um, so it's a one way of fixing the problem that we had. So there we are. I need to just clean that up because there's a bit of glue sticking to it. Um, let's uh, let's do the intonation bit. Let's look down at the look down at the. This thing. Now, I honestly don't know if there's any point intonating with uh, rusty strings, but we'll do it anyway and see where we get to. Um, so, to intonate, we use the good old fashioned tuner, and I'm going to pr pr prep that, prop that up there like that which I like to do to keep the, this from pressing in the ground and bending the internal jack parts. Now what we want is to tune to the harmonic 12th ping and then we want the fretted 12th on that note, on that string, to be the same note. It's very good these bridges, they come really positioned. That's showing us a bit a bit flat. Wrong, wrong string. right now because I know that the the thing is um, the strings are rusty so I don't know if we can get a, an accurate reading so I think we should get more strings and more different strings. I'm also going to do the pickups originally were quite close to the strings so I'm just going to bring them up to where they were before. Um, again it's personal preference which would be about there. Well, that's at least where Andy had it. Good. All the notes are playing. So there we go. Um, so this is sort of finished. A bit of cleaning on the sides to do. Uh, sort of finished, but we, we definitely have got to go and look, or we could go and look for a couple of extra bits. Um, there's me being completely brain off whilst thinking about replacement parts, which of course they're Imperial versus Metric, and I forgot about that bit. Um, but I, it may be that either um, Andy can live with that combination down there which is the simplest way of not adjusting um, not adjusting the original um, uh, what do they call those things post threads threaded posts um, or uh, we can go looking for if we can find um, a imperial version of the same thing so I'm just going to clean off the a bit of goo that's blue goo that's caught here and here Funny how it picks up grime like that, sticks to it. Thank you. Right, so there we have it. Saturday night at the movies. Um, yes, no more shaking, rattling of the battery. Zzz, battery, no one battery, my bought battery. Um, mostly black hardware fitted. Um, new 19 to 1 ratio tuners. We've got freshly levelled frets, but also all the playware gone, and we've got a nice low first fret action. And along with that comes the hex key, which I'm going to stick to the truss rod. I keep thinking I'm going to figure out some sort of little magnetic holding device, but I haven't quite ran, got around to that. 
Um, yeah, shame about these darned rusty preps, but I think we'll have to get some more um, and then we'll think about what else we can do in terms of if we can get uh, imperial versions of these. It'd be nice if we could just paint them black, basically. You could probably, probably uh, get a powder coating on some of it anyway, uh, turn it black. But anyway, hmm, good. Well, it's, it's playing well. It just it is a shame about the... This has shrunk a lot, this fingerboard. Um, you can, oh, there's more goo on that side. Um, this is just where glue's got on. Uh, yeah, the, fing the fingerboard has definitely shrunk, hence the problems with the, the resin, um, the sticky resin of the inlays sticking up visibly. But um, this has, this is, uh, it's shrunk to the point where you can feel that there's a Kind of lip starting to develop, um, maybe it's stopped now and it's it's dried out. But any further, and you will be able. To, well, you can feel it now. Um, but yeah, so we're we're better balanced now, I think, than we were before. And that was that was a problem with this basically the original bridge being slightly in the wrong place. And it, you know, people, some people go, oh, "Are you criticising Gibson? No, they don't put their bridges in the wrong place." Well, everybody does. Um, and you'll find that if you make your own guitars. Everybody does. It's just natural. It's human. Um, but the reason why it's difficult on this kind of guitar is because it's so unforgiving. If you, it's, if you so much as um, place the start of the drill bit a half a millimetre out of place, you will end up with a, a bridge that won't fit on because it's too tight. Or if you end up drilling... Uh, the original posts and they wander off by half a mil you'll end up with this kind of misplacement here so there we go all right i'm going to collect up my bits thank you for watching sorry it wasn't very straightforward gl you know, glorious one but um hopefully andy's going to enjoy that when we get some new strings on um uh, i see where that's that's some that's where the yellows come from that stickers uh, bleached, leached out some of its yellow, unfortunately, when wiping it down. But so I kept clear of the writing, but I think I picked up some yellow stain from the smiley face. See that? Lost a bit of colour there. And I think I might have it. Some of it. Um, well, I did have some of it on my hands. <gasps> okay. Thanks for watching. See you again tomorrow, actually, for the acoustic Andy's acoustic. See you then. <laughs>